Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to MDC Connects. Um, I'm Sarah Brockbank. I'm from Medicines Discovery Catapult, and I'm hosting the webinar today with my colleague, David Pennington. So this is now the second in the series, um, it's a series of five weekly webinars that run every Tuesday at one o'clock. Okay. So each year, Medicines Discovery Catapult aims to connect the community by running a short series of weekly webinars. And we come together with experts from across the community to deliver the sessions. And these are an informative series um, of webinars. So in previous years, um, we focused on science, um, but this year we're doing something a bit different and we're looking more from the business an angle of bringing your innovation um, through to commercialization. <clears throat> so last week we set out the challenges um, and we focused on the current economic climate and in particular the impact on that on companies that are early in their life cycle. And this week, we're gonna move forward with some of the solutions. So we're going to look at securing funds today, and then we're going to look at building the science and accessing the skills and the capabilities and infrastructure, and then growing your business by protecting your intellectual property. And then finally, commercializing your innovation and the options that are available for that. So we've got a truly expert lineup of speakers this year. We've got venture capitalists and funders, and TTOs, and patent attorneys, and science parks and CROs, um, all freely giving their expertise. But today we're talking about securing funds and we're joined by three speakers. So we've got Mark Wyatt, who's an investment director at Northern Gritstone, and he's going to give us an introduction to external investment and what investors are looking for. And he's got a few take home messages for us. Then we're joined by Samana Brannigan from Innovate UK. Um, she's head of health technologies and she leads the biomedical catalyst program and we'll focus um, her talk on, on this. And then finally, uh, Michael Salapo, who's also an investment director, but at Start Code on, and he's gonna give us some real tactical tips on the importance of being pitch ready. So at the end of each of the presentations today, we have two minutes for questions. If you can put your questions into the Q&A box, there's a Q&A <coughs> box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So please put the questions in there, not in the chat box, and our speakers will um, answer these at the end of each of the talks. Add your questions at any time, though. So let's get started. So, Mark, over to you. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, hopefully everybody can uh, see the screen okay. Um, uh, and I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to everybody today um, in terms of um, <clears throat> giving you a, a general introduction into external investment. Um, as Sarah mentioned, I work for an investment company called Northern Gritstone. Really briefly, we manage about £300 million pounds of um, money and we're focused on investing in IP-rich science-based businesses in the north of England. Um, Way back when, in the distant past, I trained as a pharmacologist, so I have uh, some personal interest in the life science sector. Uh, and <clears throat> at Gritstone, that's where I focus investing predominantly in anything from spin-out businesses through to later stage opportunities. Um, <clears throat> but what I want to talk about today isn't just a, a, a Gritstone-focused, uh, centric view of the world. Um, I'm going to give you a a broad brush overview of things to think about if you're considering raising external investment, um, the options that you might have. Um, so it's not just about uh, institutional money, um, thinking about the journey that you're gonna go on um, and then finishing obviously with the thing that I'm most comfortable and familiar with, which is the institutional view of what investors are looking for.
So questions to think about um, <clears throat> ahead of even raising money. So um, this isn't a journey that's suitable for everybody. And um, there's some fundamental questions you're going to want to ask yourself before you go on what can be quite a time consuming and challenging um, journey. <clears throat> One of the first things to think about is why, why are you raising money? And it, it could be for a variety of different reasons, such as um, obviously in this life science sector, some of the funding requirements can be well beyond the means of an individual to fund themselves. Uh, in negative circumstances, it might be because the company you're in has run out of money, so you have no choice but to, to seek it. But I think the best reasons um, and, and the right reasons for, for doing so are on the right of this slide. Really, if you're bringing external capital into a business opportunity, it should be to grow that business faster and to drive the risks out of the business. And if you do those two things, then you're going to add value to the company that you're in. And that's really what this is all about. <clears throat> so <clears throat> this is very much, um, I'm not going to speak to this slide verbatim, but this is very much things to think about from the entrepreneur's point of view, from the company owner's point of view, before they go down um, this route of bringing in external capital. Um, <clears throat> and, and these can be very personal things, such as, you know, what sort of time commitment will I need to give to the business? Um, how much risk am I willing to take? Are you going to leave a full-time, well-paid job and do an early stage opportunity? Um, what sort of control will I have to, to give up in my business? And I'll talk on the next slide about some of the options. In certain circumstances, you don't have to give up any control. Uh, in other circumstances, you will be giving up some of the equity in your business and some of the control in the business. Fundamentally, though, the, the point to think about here is often it's more than just about uh, the money itself. There's all these other personal considerations that you need to take into account. <clears throat> so, as I said, this although I work for an institutional investor, this isn't an advert for uh, raising money from institutional investors. We're the right source in certain situations and in other circumstances, there's a whole variety of other things and places that you might be able to go uh, for investment. And this can, can range from uh, sweat equity, where you work for no pay. Um, and that doesn't necessarily have to be um, taking unreasonable risks. Uh, if we're looking at academic uh, spin outs, they can happily carry on in the day job. And this becomes a bit of a side project. You can go to friends and family, and that has pros and cons, right? You, you know, you obviously know you well, they probably want to support you. But think about the responsibilities of if um, uh, family members have given you a significant amount of their savings into an early stage business that's then running out of money. It, it can put an awful lot of stress and, stress and pressure on you. So think about all these different um, options. And <clears throat> what I'll try and explain in the next uh, slide is that some of these options are better suited to different businesses and different businesses at different stages of their evolution. So <clears throat> we like to think that there's a bit of a stairway when it, when it comes to fundraising. And it's important to think about when to raise funds and at which stages these different sources of capital might be available to you. So in the pre-seed, the very early stages, the you know company formation stages, it, it can be hard to get institutional money in at that stage because the requirements might not be that great um, in terms of the amount of capital you need. And you've got um, not as much evidence as to, um, as to where the business has got to in terms of its growth. So self-finance, friends and family grants at the early stage. And as you can see, as you move along and the value in the business increases as it grows, as its revenues grow, as the data packages it have, um, grows, and that's where you move further towards these institutional <clears throat> um, money managers. So the venture capital funds who like to take risks on pre-profitable businesses, the private equity funds that will help you scale um, more mature, profitable businesses, and even the public markets. Um, these things all have a place to play in, in this journey. So planning, <clears throat> planning for these different stages is a really important thing to do. So as I've said, that long-term planning um, is really important. And I'm only going to draw out a couple of points on this slide, really. One of which is often if you're in a 
business which starts off developing technology, um, is very, very research focused, and then through several rounds gets towards sales. It's likely that the people within the team need to change over time. So don't fear that. Just be open to it and think about it from the outset so you're comfortable with the evolution of the business. And then the other classic phrase that you will hear from a sort of institutional investors, which is something you need to think about, back to those personal questions to ask yourself, is <clears throat> would you rather have a bigger slice of a small pie or a smaller slice of a big pie? Managing the business yourself and having a lifestyle company which you're in control of, you like to have that, you know, um, big pie, big slice of a smaller pie. If you take on the institutional VC money, then you're trying to grow the grow it much bigger, but you're going to have to give them some of your equity up to get there. <clears throat> and then a take home message from one of my friends is, is um, remember that the valuations only theoretical on your shares until you actually get to the exit of them, which is what an institutional investor is going to want to see. So moving through now, I've given you a flavor for some of the things to think about, some of the options that you have. But if you move into trying to pitch your business to institutional investors like ourselves, then the first thing you have to remember is, although it's been very hard to come up with the really neat idea that you've got, the VC statistics say that investors invest in about one to 3% of the opportunities that they see. So to some extent to us, ideas are easy because we're swimming in opportunity. And the thing that really differentiates is the ability to execute and make things happen. <clears throat> So bear that in mind, it's a tough journey if you go out to pitch to institutional investors. <clears throat> different investors are looking for different things, and this is a really important point as well. So it can be time consuming, can be a long winded process, but you've got some really great research skills and you sh should use them, right? Um, different investors um, uh, tend to be looking for different stuff, but we all advertise what's in our portfolios. So you should look for investors who are investing in similar businesses to yourself at the same stage and in the same sorts of science and technology areas. And then you're maximizing your chance that at least you're going to be talking to somebody who's interested to hear your pitch. Um, should we be honest about um, the stage of development of the business? Because that's what this is all about. It's trying to build up a rapport and find somebody who understands the risks and understands the opportunity. So in terms of what we look for, there's five key areas of your business that we're going to uh, take a view on. People, market, the returns potential, the technology, and the business model. I've kind of made these all equally important in this slide, but it's probably fair to say that a lot of VCs will focus on the people aspect and the market aspect. There's a, there's a phrase in the industry that says, I'd rather have a great team managing mediocre technology than a great technology with a mediocre team. So the people piece of your proposition is really important. And so is the market, because the VCs were looking for a very high uh, multiple of the money we put in at exit. And the best way to be able to justify that is to be playing in really large market opportunities. <clears throat> so a little bit more about what I mean in terms of these different areas of um, the business uh, that we appraise. In terms of people, it's probably backable CEO and a credible chair. And, and what, what that means is people who've probably been there, done it before, got a bit of gray hair and wisdom. And if you're an early stage business and you don't have some of these things, it's the sort of thing that you can bring in and start to build out um, to really make a difference in terms of your engagement with investors. We like to see engaged founders. Um, we're not looking to push the people with the ideas out and professionalize the management. Often these people need to be in stay, uh, engaged uh, for a significant amount of time. And so uh, that's really important to us. Track record, as I've said, uh, suitable board and advisors. The advisory network can be really credible and it gives investors uh, reference points to check out uh, what the founding team are saying. And also, like I said, everything doesn't have to be there on day one. Having an appropriate hiring plan, showing that you've thought about the journey that you're going on is absolutely fine. It's not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of uh, good planning. Technology, obviously, um, we're looking for differentiation, uh, being able to articulate what the what the state of the art is, how the industry does something now, who else is trying to do different things, and being able to paint that picture is really important. 
clear development plan is important to us. We tend to be quite milestone driven uh, as institutional investors. So we want to understand how much money is required to get from A to B. Strong IP position and strategy. I think they're two separate points. Um, so it's not just about patents. Um, it's about understanding uh, what, what intellectual property you have speaks to the value proposition of the business. And sometimes it's just as important to know what not to patent as what to patent. <clears throat> so, um, and suitable arrangements, that's, um, especially if you're a spin out, just making sure all the audit trail is, is clear um, for the investor to see. Market, as I've said, size is really important. Um, it can be okay to, to really dominate a niche, but in general, we're looking for large market opportunities, articulation of the need. Um, as I said, if you've got um, evidence that the market cares, be that customers or people that you've spoken to, that's really important. And a realistic view as to um, how much of the marketplace you can address. Often people will talk about uh, billion dollar markets, but when you boil it down and look at it from a bottom up approach, uh, it can be far, far smaller than that. So being realistic about what you can get to is really important to us. Business model um, is clearly important, especially in the life sciences sector. Um, a lot of businesses and uh, the way you build them, uh, it's a well-trodden path. So if you're a clinical development um, company, um, you know the jumping off points through the different phases are well understood. So people in the team that have that domain knowledge about um, how to walk from where you are on your scientific journey through to actual pounds into the business, that's really important. Um, evidence of traction always helps, but as I say, there's a spectrum of investors that will like things from earlier stage to later stage. So it doesn't really matter where you are on that journey, as long as you're pitching to people who care. Revenue model is important, so it's not just great science is going to sell itself, but how does this industry work? Where does the, you know, um, value accrue um, at different points? Having a clear, uh, measurable plan that explains all that is really important to us. The return is important and uh, much as you may or may not appreciate this, it isn't all about uh, the institutional investor buying in at the cheapest price possible. We want to see management teams motivated with the right amount of value in the right hands. So um, we can't overpay, but nor do we want to squeeze the valuation down. So this is always going to be a conversation and we're looking to get to realistic valuations that mean everybody can win on the journey. There's enough room for the people who invest at one round to see a return when you get to the next round. So sensible raise amounts is all to do with where, where are the value inflection points? Can we get there? Can we give you enough cash to have some slippage and still be building value? Um, so we look at all those things. Um, an exit potential obviously is critical. There's often a lot of precedent transactions in the biotech space that can help um, build your, your case for how you can go from one point today to a much more valuable point in the future. So I know that was a whistle stop tour and um, very high level, but hopefully it's given you a few um, few things to think about in terms of um, approaching and thinking about um, external investment for your business. So I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Mark. That was that was grand. Um... And it was actually useful that I noticed that you had in, in your talk, you highlighted um, having a suitable IP strategy. And just as a heads up um, to people that we will be building on the IP strategy and how to have a suitable IP strategy for your business growth in our fourth webinar in this series. Um, we've got a question coming in in the um, Q&A at the minute. So the first one is, Mark, could you say something about licensing in technology? Yeah, sure. Um, I think there's different ways to go about um, uh, creating a company. So at Northern Gritstone, we tend to focus uh, quite heavily on university spin outs and uh, invariably as well as much as there is a debate around uh, equity um, with the founding institution, more and more they're moving towards a sort of uh, lower equity stakes license agreements alongside that. And certainly, um, if you're an entrepreneur with a great idea about um, market space that has a problem, 
Um, but you don't have the benefit of having 10 years and multi-million pounds worth of academic research behind you, then an obvious place to go is to simply uh, license that in to, to your own opportunity. So I don't really mind which way around you go about doing that, but, but clearly um, there are certain businesses which um, unless you have an intellectual property position, you're never going to uh, raise the money to, to exploit that particular opportunity. So in licensing is a viable route to go. We've got to, we've got quite a lot of questions coming in, Mark. So I'm going to ask you to to try and address some of these um, by texting people back. But just sure. before, before we go to that, is could you talk us through your due diligence process and how long does it typically take, and what can founders do to help with this process? I, I think that's probably a, a completely different 15, 15 minute session. What founders can do to help? So this is really simple, right? And the the, the best thing I can say to, to answer that question is. Um, the more preparatory work you can do and the easier you make it, uh, the job, um, the quicker you will get through the process. So by that, what do I mean? A good way of thinking about that is if you have a 10 slide pitch deck and you'll hear more about pitch decks, then that is enough to potentially get somebody's interest, but it's not enough to get them to invest. So every time you make an assertion or a point, so whether you have one slide on competition, if you had a PDF sitting behind that with really great granularity as to how you see the competitive environment, loads of detail about it. You've just saved me a load of time in having to go around and, and figure that out myself. So if you've got that supporting evidence and, and detail behind anything that you assert, it's going to make it, it quicker. The, the honest answer is it's it's a horses for courses process that and, and it can take as long as it can take. But typically we would do um, IP due diligence, that doesn't have to take very long. Uh, we'd probably do some technical due diligence. Again, that doesn't have to take very long. So I think investment processes can be anything from, you know, two months to six months, depending on how easy it is and what you find and how well prepared you are. So that, that the trick is to be well prepared and then it'll be a quicker process. Brilliant. Thank you, Matt. Um, okay. Um... Now, Samana from Innovate UK, you want to head off? Okay, well, um, welcome everyone to this, to this uh, webinar and thank you, Mark. It's been such a great presentation. So I think as, um, as Sarah mentioned already, I'll focus on talking about the Biomedical Catalyst, which is our main flagship program. But I just want to, sorry, I just have to see which way. Time to take my slide to the next thing. It doesn't let me do that. Perfect. Sorry. Um, yeah. So, it's, so I'm just uh, I'm from Innovate UK. I'm sure everybody already knows Innovate UK. We're the UK innovation agency and really focus on industry-led R&D. So we support industry doing innovation and growing new products and growing the economy. So I work in the health team. So I just wanted to give a bit of background on what the health team does. And our budget is about 675 million for this um, spending review period, which ends in 2025. Um, and we focus really on fund funding things through Future Economy, which has AMR, which uh, MDC are really involved in, also transforming medicine manufacturing. We work with Department of Health and deliver a lot of programs in vaccines and AMR through, through our managed program. But our main program in, for, for life sciences company is the Biomedical Catalyst. So I'll spend most of my talk, talk, time talking about that. Um, so just in terms of our funding, we do funding, but we also do non-cash support. So as I mentioned, we've got grant funding, such as the Biomedical Catalyst and SMART program, which a lot of you will be aware of. But we also do things like loans, where if you've got uh, initial stage in innovation, you want to sort of go to the next stage of your development, you can apply for loans. We have a program called Investor Partnership, which we um, fund uh, aligned investment with, uh, with Mark and sort of start code on. Uh, but we also fund companies, uh, sort of giving them an ecosystem where they can help the innovation, help the innovation journey. So this is through our skills program, where we, we fund a future leadership program from industry. We also have the knowledge transfer partnership, and also iCure and uh, other scaling programs, which uh, which early stage innovators can apply for, which includes life sciences. We have our catapult net network and other um, sort of collaborative uh, funding mechanisms that you can apply for. 
And we also do things on the global side. We've got, we, we look after the Horizon program through our national contact points, but we also do quite a lot of global technology missions where we take SMEs to various locations around the world where they can sell or improve their technology. So just the Biomedical Catalyst Program, um, it's uh, it's been around for 2012, so it's been going for more than 10 years. Um, we have funded more than 300 million, 320 million into this program since its inception. Um, it's a program open to any SME doing any sort of technology in health, as long as you, you can um, show that you are improving health and having economic benefit for the UK, you can apply into this program. Uh, so it is technology agnostic. The main aim of the program is really to get the companies to that investment readiness phase or, and also to address that funding gap, which is at that early stage innovation process where you're doing very risky research and an investor may not be interested at that stage. So really, we're trying to de-risk de that uh, high-risk innovation to help you have the right data and the right amount of um, sort of in information so you can get an investor to grow your company. So currently we have a budget of 140 million, which is for this SR period, which ends in April 25. Um, the program has been around for 10 years. As I said, it was a grant funding program, but we are now, we have sort of developed a new structure for the program, which really takes into account that technology agnostic stream, which is really what our stakeholders want, which, what the companies want, but also looking at how can we improve the program to try and get more private investment, which is needed for our, in, for our industry to grow, but also look at how do we increase more innovative projects coming into the into that program. For example, we've got an excellent research base, but we don't always get those companies coming into Innovate UK. So we're working closely with the research base and looking at that early stage startups, areas of commercialization and bringing an ecosystem support around those businesses. Um, so I'll just talk a little bit about each of those parts of the programs. So, so just to sort of give you um, what the program is like. So we have an industry-led R&D, which is technology agnostic. It's a grant funding program, which opens twice a year. And really it's in two different streams. We have, a below, if you're looking for below 500K, it's a single stage process. You apply for funding and we do our assessment and you get funding. If you're looking for more than 500K, then it's a two stage process where you would be invited to an interview. It is technology agnostic, as I have said. Um, then we also have uh, investor partnership, which I mentioned at the at the early stage of, of my presentation. And in this case, we bring aligned investment. And again, it's technology agnostic. And then, as I mentioned, we are trying to be a bit more thematic, looking at areas where we haven't funded before and where we could have an impact to commerce, commercialize our research base. And these are thematic and we bring an ecosystem alongside our funding and uh, we have a feasibility funding at the end of it. It, it. This this part of our program is also to improve the type of applications we come that come into our feasibility program. So our success rate is improved as well. So I'll just talk a little bit about each of those programs. Sorry, my thing doesn't move as easily the next stage thing. So this is our technology agnostic um, uh, industry-led R&D. So as I said, you, you know, you can apply for any, any sort of project that has a health, health background, um, but we do do a portfolio approach. So we have a therapeutic strand, a med tech strand, and a digital health strand. So when we get our, when we get our applications, we, um, we ensure that we are funding each of those strands in an equal measure. And so we do a portfolio approach. And generally, you, you can apply for up to four million pounds of project costs, and we give you a grant of about two million at the most. So a 70% um, grant rate for each of the projects, and the projects can be up to three years. Um, we've just closed a call. We'll be announcing our, when, when, uh, our um, sort of successful uh, applicants quite soon for our last BMC call, and the next one will open on the 17th of June. So that's our call for the next for this coming year. Um, I know everyone's always interested in uh, uh, how um, success rates are because obviously our, our programs tend to be quite highly um, sought after. So for the last couple of rounds of BMC, I've just shown you there's about 15 to 17% fund success rate for our industry-led R&D. So although it's still not as high as it could be. And really the reason our success rate is around that is because we don't have enough budget. So generally speaking, we could fund more projects, but we have to draw a line with our budget. So this is our, this, this, these are the last three competitions and our success rate tends to be around that for the industry-led competition. 
So I just also wanted to sort of show you a range of companies that we have funded through this program. As you can see, there's quite a lot. The program has been going for 10 years. So there's probably a lot of companies that you can recognize. So they range from anything from therapeutics, med tech, um, child health and oncology. So it's a range of companies. So really anything that has a human health impact, it can be funded through this program. Uh, and just sort of giving you a bit of an idea about things that we have funded. So, you know, as again, you can see it's AI for health, there's platform driven technologies, um, there's neurodegenerative, neuro, neurodegenerative diseases, uh, uh, oncology. So there's so really any sort of thing is covered with the bio, bio, by the biomedical catalyst, as long as it shows value for money and has commercial potential that, that our assessors look at, it will get funded. Um, so the next one is the Biomedical Catalyst Investor Partnership. I think I mentioned a little bit about that at the very beginning. So in this case, we have partnered with a range of investors and we provide the non-diluted funding through grant and the investor comes in with uh, aligned investment. So generally speaking, we fund still our grant funding covers 70% of the project, co project costs and the investor partner comes in with potentially the same amount of money to cover the project, but also to cover company's growth. So it really is bringing equity finance into the company from the very early stage of its inception. And we come in to reduce the risk for the investor. So looking at areas where the investor may not have funded by themselves and we're de-risking that investment into the, into the technology areas. So the investor also becomes aware of those areas and we have more investment going into specific um, technology areas that we, we think UK have potential to grow, to grow in. Um, so just really quickly, so we've, we've done uh, investor partnerships since 2017, uh, and our first investor partnership was actually in health. So we had, um, we've also done one in precision medicine. And as you can see from the stats there, that for every, for our for 42 million grant that we put in into 162 SMEs, there was 123 million from investors and it was 373 million additional investment following that. So in this spending review period, we have gone out and onboarded quite a lot of investors and we have 80 million budget com competed across all technology areas and Biomedical Catalyst is also included in that. Um, we have onboarded more than 100 investors and I have provided a link in here because you can have a look at the investors that are already on our website. Uh, so these are some of the investors and you can see some of Northern Grento and uh, Start Cordon are also on it. So we, uh, we we work in partnership with these investors and through the Biomedical Catalyst program, people can link up with the investors and apply to our funding program. So just a little bit about the life sciences part of it. We, as I said, the initial investor partnerships had a focus on life sciences as well. We funded quite a lot of projects, 74, and I think there was 211 million of additional investment that went into those companies that had the investor partnerships initially. Through the current Biomedical Catalyst program, we've already spent about 10 million grant. And as you can see, we've already seen further investment in those companies just in the last two years. Um, and the investor partnership program has already already ran about five rounds in the last in this in the last two years, and the sixth round is closing on the 27th of February. So it's currently open. Uh, and then just finally, I'll talk about the, our um, accelerator feasibility, because this, this is the only part of the biomedical catalyst, which is technology uh, specific. So it really is about bringing an ecosystem around our innovators. So when we had an evaluation of the biomedical catalyst for the early stage companies, one of the things that was clear is it's not just the investment or the money that they need. They also need support to understand their IP strategy, their route to market, and also understand what the project they're taking forward is actually worth taking all the way next to the feasibility study. Uh, so we're really working quite closely with our research council partners, MRC, and bringing in uh, sort of areas where they have that funding that has gone into where an academic is really ready to maybe start a spin out and bringing them into this program and helping them evaluate their business plan and value proposition to make sure that they are ready for the feasibility study or were even ready to have that business go to the next stage. So it really is like a funnel approach where you're supporting more businesses at, at that level and then ensuring that only the ones that are ready can go to the next stage. So we've ran a feasibility program already. So we've partnered with various accelerators across the UK. And really it's like the stage one where they come into the accelerator and then go through um, an initial uh, initial sort of training and pre-accelerated program. And then the last 10 companies have gone through a more 
um, sort of intense program. And then we would we have a close competition at the end of it for a feasibility uh, funding, which is really funded 100 percent at 100 K. So they don't have to raise any finance at that early stage. And we provide a much simplified application process and also support all those companies that come through the application process. So we have done four accelerators under the biomedical catalyst, and these really have focused on child health, microbial technologies, female health technology, and neurotech. And these these areas were selected based on what we were uh, what we were already seeing through our program, where there was a demand for more funding or more early stage fund early stage commercialization, and also from our research councils where they thought they had already um, committed funding, but we ha haven't seen enough coming through to commercialization. Um, so, just want to sort of give you a bit of an idea. We we chose. I'm giving female health as an example. So when we looked at our funding across female health across all our programs, we didn't have a lot of funding that was going into this space. It's a it's an area significantly underfunded across all our technology all our areas. So we were really looking to see how can we boost that area and make sure we get more projects going forward into that area. And it's it's got a a like, significant unmet need across therapeutics, diagnostics, and also in just in general health data. And um, there is there is a significant global market. Um, and there's also had been uh, a lower historic um, private investment. So we, we focused on this area. And what we've seen is after running the accelerator, we've already seen increased number of companies coming in this space through our biomedical catalyst. We also have found that we have um, sort of interest from our global colleagues. For example, following our accelerator, we were able to have an incubation program for female health through with our New York and Boston offices um, because there was an interest from the investors in this space. So, I mean, we're, we're looking at the next round of accelerators now and we're trying to develop, uh, looking at what we will look at next. And currently we're still deciding about the next areas, but we, we are currently considering as, for example, AI for health because it's an area we know there's a lot of sort of up and coming projects coming through. So we just we, we will be potentially looking at that as the next area and it'll be announced sometime in April. So just th that was really a whistle top tour of Biomedical Catalyst. So if I have any questions or anything, you can just let me know. Um, but I'll stop. Oh, I will let you know about the competitions that are currently open. So I should really plug them. So we've got three different competitions that are open to life companies currently that you can apply for. They're on the website, they close, some of them close in April and May, and there's one closing in March, which is really the innovation loan one that I mentioned earlier on. So anyway, thank you for your time and I'll stop there. Okay, thanks very much, Samana. We've got, to, we've got time for a question. Um, so I've got one here that, is it made clear in the feedback whether you were in unsuccessful due to portfolio balancing versus scoring poorly? Um, I think that it all depends on what, I mean, generally speaking, we we were, we are trying to change that process internally to when, when people have scored highly that we let them know that we've run out of budget, but I'm not really sure whether that's consistently, consistently what, that whether we do that all the time. Um, but you can get feedback and you, you will be able to find out your score. So if you score over 70, you, you are fundable. Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Amanda. So over to Michael, we're going to get some tips on, on how we actually get ourselves pitch ready. So over to you, Michael. Hi, good Good afternoon, everyone. It's a huge pleasure being here to speak from you today. My name is Mike Salako. I'm Investment Director at Start Codon. I'm entitled to this talk, the importance of being pitch ready. Points I'd like to cover would just be an outline just who Start Code or not. Um, also points that you need to think about when trying to be pitch ready. And then I'd just like to finish up with um, just a quick summary of what you need to remember to try and be pitch ready. Just in terms of Start Code, and before I touch on that, I'd like to touch on something that you know Mark has already um, outlined, and that's what venture capital is and in general venture capital is just an investment of a pool of capital from so-called lps limited partners um, and they're the investors who provide us the gps the managers um, 
a chance to manage this capital. And they do that by enabling us to invest in businesses. Now, the key point around this is that we want these businesses to grow. Um, but the aim is that these businesses will get towards what's called a liquidity event where they will exit. And that could be via trade sale, merger and acquisition, or a listing on a stock exchange. And what happens then is that that you know exit, the proceeds from that will be passed on to those LPs, those investors, as, along with a premium. So their money comes back as well as a premium for them locking up that money. But the main aim, actually what we do, is to really maximize patient benefit. And I mention that is because you may already be on that path of towards the life cycle of a venture. You may be undertaking basic research. So you may have, you know, taken the time to write lots of applications and bring in research grants. And you may be really adept at that and be bringing in, you know, quite a number of research grants. So your net cash flow positive, you're increasing the amount of grants you've got undertaking that really great and exciting research. Some of that basic research may lean on to and turn into more applied research. So maybe thinking about ability to translate those ideas, you may have been successful in getting developmental grants. And again, the work may be proceeding. But what happens then is that it's very difficult to find routes and you know funding to take it to that next step to provide some proof of concept data to build a working prototype, to build an engineering prototype, even production prototype, or going forward and you know trying to take that product and introducing it onto the market. Because to try and get through that path, what you'll be doing is basically using up capital. And it's very limited in terms of trying to get sources of capital to actually do that. Now, historically, Mark touched on, you could rely on maybe friends, family, and you know the founders themselves, angel investors, early stage venture capitalists to try and bridge that gap and de-risk the opportunity to get, you know, further venture capital funding and all the way to that exit event. And what we do as venture builders, investors, is that we try and bridge that early stage gap to try and support the companies through that valley of death and de-risk it for later stage investors. And so Starcode is basically um, early stage venture capital fund and venture builder. And our aim is to discover, nurture and advance next generation of healthcare and life science companies. So in terms of what you need to be pitch ready, then one thing I'd love to clear up now is this misconception around the pitches. So there's always this idea from founders that you put together this really amazing pitch deck and then you reach out to investors and straight away they're going to say come over to my you know my office and we gather the other investors together and there may even be some investors you know online remotely and you can pitch to them and we'll give you feedback that rarely happens and the reason why that rarely happens is because investors are extremely busy they're sourcing opportunities, they're diligence in these opportunities, they're negotiating license term sheets and negotiating term sheets for investment docs, long form docs for investments, they're sitting on boards, they're traveling, they're doing, you know, a whole range of things. But what they, you know, have limited time for is that early, you know, ability to just get on a call with investors and actually be taken through that pitch. What they're more likely to say is, can you send me your deck? And the reason why I stress that is that whilst you know you have a pitch ready for you to deliver, as most times these decks will have to be submitted without you being able to narrate, you've always got to bear in mind that you need to have a deck and position that deck such that it can hold its own by itself. And be mindful that this deck may go to that person you've reached out to and that person could pass it on to other members within their team or even other investors so again without your narration the the actual deck and the messaging around the deck needs to be clear and credible and you know get through to them so with that in mind one thing you've got to do is really do your due diligence on the investor you're trying to target now in jest i put up this you know this sort of celebrity portfolio, just outlining, you know, the different portfolios of um, these different celebrities here. And as you can see, 
these celebrities who are investors, invest in a range of companies, invest in different areas and different um, spaces. And what you need to do is look at these investors and make sure you tr look through their portfolio to understand if it's in line with the opportunity you're providing. Now, even if you find an investor who says they invest in healthcare, let's say, they may invest in therapeutics companies compared to med tech or vice versa. So you need to be clear on that. At the same time, also, whilst they may invest in, say, therapeutics companies, they may be more inclined to invest in, you know, small molecules or um, you know, larger molecules as opposed to cell therapies. So again, you've got to make sure that the investor you're seeking and that you spend time to try and engage and, you know, get on side is someone that invests in your proposition. Also, when you're looking at the portfolios, be mindful and cognizant of, you know, whether within the portfolio there are any direct competitors. These are competitors who may be working on the same area and providing a similar product to address the, the problem that you're going after. Um, in general, whilst an investor may be happy to jump on a call just to understand what you're doing, it'd be unlikely if you work directly in that space to want to invest in, you know, your offering. Also, be you know, look at what's else in their portfolio, whereby these investors may you know, be open and inclined to looking at an opportunity that solves a similar problem as you're trying to do, but does it in a differentiated way. Now, that's important because investors may be open to investing in your company because you're taking a differentiated approach to solve the same problem. But again, be mindful of that and, you know, the information that you share. One thing that's really important is, you know, check LinkedIn, check social networks, check, you know, any of your contacts to try and get a warm introduction. That always goes down a lot better. Um, you know, if someone introduces you as a founder with your company and your deck, that's all. They're more likely to respond, they're more likely to, um, you know, get on board with that. And that's, again, purely just due to time constraints. So once you're armed with, you know, this knowledge and you've, you've positioned and you understand which investor you're going after, um, the key is to make sure you break down the pitch in a nice and um, easy to manage and digest way. Start with your title slide, of course, make sure it's engaging, provide an executive summary and do not forget your ask. Again, investors being time poor, having this summary, if it's only that they read, that'd be important to understand, you know, the opportunity there, maybe inclined to follow up. Do include the problem, of course, but, you know, outline and break down your solution and the technology. What we find as investors is it's very easy for, you know, um, founders to come up with really amazing science and technology that's looking for a problem. That's not a good thing. What we want to do is understand what the problem is and your unique way to solve, um, you know, come up with a solution to solve that problem. That's the, the order. You know, science alone, technology is not enough if you're out there looking for a problem to actually use it for. Don't forget to outline the product or the platform that you provide in there. Building the team. Again, you know, understanding the team, the investors, we're looking at, the backgrounds of the teams, their profiles, and you know why they're credible enough to deliver on this proposition. This actual team slide could go even higher. There, it engages investors. We say, okay, you know, the team's got the right background um, to execute on this and probably can deliver. Or there may be some gaps, and it starts making us think about who else needs to join the team to you know fulfil those gaps. Really important to make sure you showcase that. Why now is important. Maybe there's been technological advancements all alike through this. So understanding, you know, why you're coming up with this proposition or, you know, market is really important. Do not forget the market. Market, understanding the size of the market, understanding whether you need to segment that market, maybe geographically segment the market. So you're going after one area, you know, as opposed to another down the line or you're going for a certain demographic, certain, you know, maybe even a rare disease and the like. It's really good to understand the um, direction of travel there, the market you're going after. Competition is an important thing. Something we say at Dark Code on is that you don't need to be the first or the only. It's just how can we make you the best? As investors, when we see the competition slide, what we want to understand is, you know, 
you know, it indicates that there's a market for it if there are competitors, so that's not a problem. But we want to understand how you differentiate and how you potentially are better than the offering that's currently there or emerging. So it's really important to outline the, the competition there. And if they're, again, direct competitors, you put that on the slide. If there are lots of indirect competitors or even, you know, really a whole host of direct competitors, add an appendix slide at the end and really showcase that. There's always a nervousness that if you don't include a really important um, um, competitor, the investor will look at that and they will think, well, if you've missed out on that key competitor, what else have you missed out about your market? What else are you unsure about? And it makes us, you know, less confidence and opportunity. So don't be shy about putting out the, the competition there. Do outline the business model, you know, how you're going to um, make money financials and key metrics of course important online you know the fundraising amount what you're seeking what are you going to use with those proceeds and your goals and that inflection point that mark touched on and then you know we outline what you're going to do over an 18 months period and that's because in our minds investors we know it could take about 12 months around that to actually generate the data but it could really take at least six months to once you're armed with that data to go out and close the fundraising so we've got to build in that time it's not just a case of getting the money and then everyone's going to you know investors going to invest straight in you you still need some time to actually bring in investors and close the investment transactions in them before the company runs out of money so building that up in that buffer time is really important to, you know, finish off with a thank you slide and a compelling statement again to remind them who you are. One important thing I always stress that you know founders should try and do on their slides is make sure the title slide of each slide conveys what's the messaging within that single slide, such that if an investor was to just read the title slides from beginning to end of a pitch dig they would understand exactly what the compelling opportunity is. Again, that's just thinking about them being time poor. So don't just leave the title slides a problem, solution, make it more granular so that they could just understand the messaging. Now we can't leave um, a talk like this without speaking to that title slide around being pitch ready. And the point about being pitch ready is you never know when you're gonna meet an investor. And you could meet an investor in a coffee shop, could meet an investor on the tube, you could meet an investor down your street, or you could meet an investor in an elevator. So let's touch on the elevator pitch here. Starts off by, you know, introducing yourself, being really engaging and warm. State the mission of your company. Also explain your company's value proposition, why you're differentiated from what else is out there, and, you know, and how you can add value to people. And finish with a call to action. Do not forget this, you know, try and provide a card or try and connect on LinkedIn and say that you're going to, you know, follow up. That's that engagement. You can always pitch to them, but if you don't leave them with a way to follow up, then you lose that opportunity. So do remember, have some kind of call to action. Things to avoid is don't speak for more than 30 seconds. In general, just don't ramble. Really high level. Don't use jargon. Whilst there may be an investor that you know, comes from a similar background to yourselves, it may have been many years um, since they were you know, working on that space, so they may not be up to speed on jargon. Best to keep things simple. And also don't speak in a monotone. Very tonation. It will engage people more. So just in summary then, um, generate a pitch deck that really doesn't require your presence to understand. Remember that your deck may be passed to other members of the team in the Venture Capital Fund or to other investors. So it's got to really be able to stand on its own without you being there to narrate. Make sure your pitch covers those key points that I've outlined there and always be prepared to live an elevator pitch. You never know when you're gonna meet an investor. Happy to be contacted and answer any questions now, but um, thanks ever so much for listening. Super, thanks Michael, that was really, really useful. So I've got some questions um, here that for um, briefly. So just um, to one of the questions, yes, copies of the slides will be available afterwards. Um, but for you, Michael, um, is it possible to submit submit a deck with a narration as part of it? It is. It is, and that can help. The only problem with that is that often 
that deck um you know if it's a powerpoint deck the narration may sit within the notes section in general as i said investors will want to pass that deck on to you know other investors within their team or outside of that and thus to make you know these decks not so big and unwieldy it tends to be sent as a pdf and thus those notes could be lost and so it's always better to just think from the get-go to make it easy and digestible without any words narration on that mainly for that that reason and then very quickly if you can manage this one and with the time we've got is what are the typical mistakes that you see in pitch decks I think the one of the, the key ones is just not enough information, too high level. Um, I, and I, I fully understand that the different investors want different things. I think a balance between, especially in the areas we, we work in healthcare and life sciences, balance a bit of data um, and then, you know, an outline just to whet the appetite around competition, the team and the market is key. Um, but you don't have to put, you know, a really big, long-winded deck, but also don't miss out the key things. If you've got really great science, you've published some really great um, publications, you know, showcase that, celebrate it. I'm actually just going to ask one more question to try and answer this really quickly so that I can introduce next week uh, before we close. Um, but it's an important question. What are the options and opportunities for obtaining training on in deck and elevator pitch development, do VCs offer this? Obviously, Samana has spoken about some of the things that Innovate do um, to help people improve what is being pitched to them. Yeah, very quickly, uh, as a venture builder, we don't just invest, we try and upskill our founders. So we do upskill them on, you know, developing decks and the likes. You've got IQ programs and other accelerator programs out there that try and support that as well. So I definitely look out for things like that. Okay, thank you, um, Michael. So that brings us to the end of this webinar, and I would like to take this opportunity to thank Mark and Samana and Michael for three really, really interesting talks that I hope have been useful to you all. So we continue in the um, series. So what we're hoping is that you've got money now, you've got your funding, and you really need to build, start building your science. So there was quite... Um, a big shout out from the community around how we access skills, specialist capabilities in the laboratory space and expertise within CROs. So next week we will be joined by Graham Wilkinson, who's head of virtual R&D at MDC, Medicines for Stomach Catapult, um, Gareth Hampton, who's head of laboratory services at Bruntwood at Alden Park, and then Mike Piper and Angelo Pugliese, um, of BioAscent, who are going to talk about accessing drug discovery expertise in CROs. So thanks again to the speakers for today, and we will see you all again next week. Thanks a lot.